well. Thanks a lot. So I'll be presenting on uh, conversions of surface-to-air missiles to surface-to-surface -surface missiles. And if you want uh, to obtain a ballistic missile, there's really three ways to do it. The first is you can make your own from scratch, and that's very technically challenging and usually requires um, ex uh, high levels of foreign assistance. The second is to buy a ballistic missile off the shelf on the export market. And the challenge there is to find someone who's willing to sell you a missile and someone who is able to make a decent missile for sale. Uh, the, third, the third way of obtaining a ballistic missile is doing this, converting a surface-to-air missile that you have or that you can purchase and using that as a ballistic missile. And the point of my talk today is to convince you that this third pathway is worth your time, that it's an important, uh, it's an important issue. And the best way I can, I hope to convince you of this is through uh, a story. Yeah. So, in 2011, the longtime Belarusian leader, Lukashenko, gave a strange speech to Russian journalists. And he claimed that the teams manning Belarus's S-300 surface-to-air missile systems had been training to use their uh, surface-to-air missile complex to hit ground targets. So the S-300 is a family name for a variety of surface-to-air missiles, and it's evolved over time since it was first uh, put on paper in the 60s and then deployed later on. It's gone through many iterations, and these systems also use different missiles. But the primary aim of these systems is to hit airplanes, it's anti-air. And what Lukashenko was claiming was that his teams had used the system uh, to launch a missile to hit a ground target. And this conference was followed, was followed by this article in the Belarusian press that said, yes, this is possible. In fact, it's been done before in the Soviets when they were designing the S-300, one of the variants in the 80s, um, tested the system in this, in this mode. And they claimed that uh, in one of the tests, the missile went 400 kilometers uh, and reached a max height of 70 kilometers. So, of course, this is not the most reliable claims. Um, this is very low max height for this range. And, uh, you know, Lukashenko and his media are not the most reliable sources. But there's one detail that um, made me think maybe there was more to the story than just a propaganda piece. And it's when they described this test, they, they didn't say that the Soviets had conducted the test specifically for this purpose. Um, so what I want to show you now is an internal video from a company that makes the missile of one of these tests. And it'll take about 30 seconds. So you can see the when the missile is launched, uh, it arcs down, it seems to arc down, and then there's a flash of light and then a plume of smoke, and that happened three times. Um, the purpose of this exercise, as far as I can tell, was actually the ignition sequence. The rest of this video is them just watching the camera pans back to the S-300 system, and they're looking at the missiles going up. And it seems like they're making sure that part goes right. But it looks like they're disposing of the missile in a ballistic trajectory. Now, this might be also just an optical illusion, because if it's going very far away, it might look like it's coming down. But I, I, think, this is, I think this is how they were disposing of it. So maybe that's what happened with this test. Maybe they were testing some other subsystem of the missile, and that was uh, the result of one of those tests. And the reason why I spent more time looking into this was because if it's true, then it's a significant problem. Um, I put this up 
because I wanted to show that there's different missiles used in the S-300. And the one I'm particularly concerned about is the one in the back, this 48 and 6. Um, this is not the largest or the best for conversion missile that the S-300 has, but it, this one is actually available for export. So if you're looking to uh, obtain a uh, convertible missile, that's a good bet. It's also a very simple missile. There's no, uh, there's no guidance fins, and it uh, looks to be a fairly robust build. You can play around with it. It also has some very nice properties if you want a ballistic missile, because it, first it uses solid fuel. And solid fuel is great for a tactical ballistic missile because you don't have to wait until it's fueled to launch it. Because you don't have to fuel it, you don't need, the, um, you don't need as many support vehicles nearby, so your signature is lower. And in case you fuel it and you decide not to launch, at least you don't have corrosion problems. So it's a very sensitive technology. You spend a lot of time trying to interdict the proliferation of solid fuel ballistic missile. And compounding this problem is the alleged 400 kilometer range. Because if you look at the other <coughs> surface, um, surface to surface <coughs> systems available that use solid fuel, um, 400 kilometers, and, the, and that are available for export, I should say, 400 kilometers is significantly better than the next best thing that you can buy. The uh, Iskander E is the export version of the Iskander uh, system and it has a 300 kilometer range. Toshka C I believe is uh, at most about 200 kilometers. So 400 is significant. And the last property that makes this 48, so this one from the back that makes it very scary is it's just under um, what you would need to fit a first generation miniaturized nuclear warhead. So 200 kilograms, 0.5 meter diameter. Um, in the 80s, the Pakistanis allegedly designed a nuclear, a miniaturized nuclear weapon that was 200, kilo, uh, 200 kilograms weight and 0.6 meter diameter. And if you really had to fit um, that Pakistani design on the 48 missile, you probably could nowadays. Uh, there's two things you can do. The first is to uh, improve on the electronics. So since the 80s, we've made a significant uh, leap in electronic technology. And the electronics for an implosion weapon take up a significant amount of space. So if you can get a small improvement in that technology, you can reduce the diameter. The other, the other thing you can do is um, you can play around with the, the missile a bit and increase the um, size by a bit. So with, what you're seeing below, this is a nuclear-capable uh, surface-to-air missile that the Soviets designed, and this is a... a an original version, you can see they've slightly increased the, there's a slight bulge here. So you can play a bit with um, the diameter. And that'll reduce um, some of the performance of the missile, but if if you have a nuclear warhead, maybe you don't need as uh, accurate a guidance system as you, as you would. So you can play a bit with the internals, play a bit with the diameter of the warhead. and potentially fit in um, first generation miniatures. So by now, I hope I've convinced you that this particular 48 missile is worth looking at in more detail. And the next step in the thesis was to try to correlate this 400 kilometer range to see if it, if it made sense. So I, I was very lucky because Schmucker and Schiller from Germany let me use their modeling software. And of course, they're not responsible for the, the models, but um, so you don't put them about that. But the, um, it, it was really nice of them to let me use the, the software for these estimates. And I don't have enough data about the 48 to make a direct model. 
and say this is probably what it does. The best thing I can do is give a, a lower bound on its performance and a potential upper bound. Because there's not enough information about the 48's uh, engine available. On its um, average and max velocities are also not revealed. We do, however, have more information about the 48's predecessor. So the conservative estimate is based on uh, assuming that the engine that was used in the 5V55R was just transposed into the 48. We know that's not the case. We know the engine was improved, but that gives you the conservative estimate. And that's uh, already 200 kilometers <coughs> range. The upper bound estimate is um, more speculative. It's looking at the uh, dry mass and um, fueled mass of the missile, trying to see what a reasonable ratio might be, looking at um, what other systems of that nature had for that ratio, and making sure that the number obtained looks like it could fit in the, in the missile. And with, uh, with that, you get about 400 kilometer range. I'm happy to talk more about the uh, estimates during question time if you want to have uh, a lot of slides, and most of these slides are extras. So. so what this shows you is that we it does look like we have a problem with this 48 on the export market for the conversion. And the next, um, the next point I want to make is that these conversions, it, this is not something I cooked up for the thesis. Uh, this has happened before, and it's been used in a, as a starter for ballistic missile programs by certain countries. Um, so some countries used this as their first ballistic missile and um, learned about the technologies involved and then used that when they made an upgrade, when they made more. And I'll bring some case studies. Um, I looked at South Korea, Iraq, Iran, there's also China, but it's the same missile that Iran obtained in the end. And these are some pictures of the converted missiles. And so for South Korea and Iraq, um, missile conversions played a big role in their ballistic missile program. For Iran, not so much. These are the performance, uh, so you have the country, you have the base missile that was converted and the name of the converted missile, and then you have the performance of the converted missile here. And you can see there's a wide range of uh, possibilities, but they're all in the tactical uh, range category. And the other thing I want to point out is that when these were converted, when most of these were converted, the surface air missile was obsolete at the time of conversion, with the exception of the South Korean case. So nowadays, with better, larger surface-to-air missiles, you can improve on the you can improve on the range. The other important case is the South Korean one. If we're looking back at this 48 a missile that's used in the S300, because the South Korean missile was solid-fueled, and the fact that they managed to convert it proves that there is no intrinsic technological barrier <coughs> preventing conversion of a solid fuel missile. Uh, you can do it. So by now I hope I've convinced you that these conversions are a problem. So one the, the remaining part of the thesis was looking at possible solutions. And one of the options was the strengthening rules on the missile technology control regime to take into account the potential for conversion of surface-to-air missiles. So if I'm a company that wants to export a surface-to-air missile, maybe there should be some additional guidelines before I can export this missile, even if the max range is below MTCR controls. Because when you convert the missile, you obtain better range. So. The problem is that this, uh, the MTCR rules for conversions are very unclear. I call it loophole, maybe someone disagrees, but um, 
if you look at the text, you have two paragraphs that basically contradict each other. Um, if I'm if uh, I'm a company that wants to export a missile, and someone comes up to me with just the bottom paragraph, and I'm selling a surface-to-air missile, if you just read this, we'll be determined using a trajectory that maximizes range. That trajectory is the ballistic trajectory. So if someone just shows me this paragraph, it looks like I have to uh, compute how well my missile does in ballistic mode, and then that becomes the max range. But in reality, because it's not part of the design characteristics of the system, I can say, look, I'm selling a surface-to-air missile. It's not designed to go ballistic mode. You probably need to make some modifications for it to do that. That's outside of my um, that's outside of my range of problems, and the and we've never tested it this way. So for our uh, design characteristics, the max range is whatever it, how far it can go up against the enemy. So as far as uh, I'm concerned, that's a loophole in the MTCR. But the problem is that we, we also export surface-to-air missiles, we as in the, the US. And uh, scholars from other countries have pointed out that some of our export uh, missile exports would violate the MTCR if we close this loophole. This is one example from Chinese authors. And they did um, something very similar to what we did with the S-300. They took a US system. Uh, made some models about how well it might convert, and then said, well, this seems like it's violating MTCR controls. Um, so at this point, it leaves us with not very many options if we can't prevent the export of these systems. What's the next best thing? Um, technical countermeasures, I, I looked a little bit into that. And there's one case where jamming would have been useful, looking back at the case studies. But I think that's more the exception than the rule. So when the South Koreans did their conversion of the Nike Hercules, um, they had so many subsystems to develop and produce that they decided to leave the old guidance system in for the first iteration of the missile. And because they knew how to use that missile with the old guidance system in uh, ground attack mode. And they knew it was easy to jam but because there were so many other technologies they had to master, they decided to leave that out for a further upgrade. And that upgrade took a long time for them to put in place. So for a number of years, a South Korean missile was uh, vulnerable to jamming. But if you look at more recent cases like Iraq, the Iraqis immediately removed the old guidance system and put in an inertial guidance system, which was resistant to jamming. The interesting part is the Iraqis knew their guidance system was really bad, and that's why you can see the, um, if I go back to the table, you can see the inaccuracies were huge. That's one of the reasons why. But the, they decided to uh, do the conversion straight away. And in that case, jamming <coughs> doesn't get you much. So jamming, maybe, if the country has an obsolete SAM, and they're converting it, but... Uh, with modern SAMs, with modern proliferators, probably not a good option. That really leaves us with the last option, which is to pay more attention to this problem, particularly when uh, we or our allies are exporting missiles. The more specialized the missile is, the harder it is to convert. You can see this in the Iraqi case uh, very nicely because they converted a whole family of systems. They started out with an early version of the SA-2, and that was very easy to convert, and they had good results with it. And then they ran out of the early model, models of the SA-2, and they had a deal with the upgraded SA-2, and there they had to start filing off some of the guidance fins, small guidance fins, but it, the conversion was still fairly straightforward. When they moved on to the SA-3, they started having more issues, and the, they just could not get it um, to perform well aerodynamically. Uh, again, there's guidance issues, but then they also had problems with the, the engine. Um, and when they moved on and they tried to convert the SA-6, which is this very fancy anti-air um, SAM, 
it's very specialized for that role, uh, it was impossible and they, their program completely failed with the SA6. And if you look at the Unmovic files, um, they explained the sorts of changes that the Iraqis would have to make for the, the SA6 to be used in a ground attack mode. And of course, this is not detailed, um, but you can see the, the just the long list of changes that would have had to be made. It, it, it sounds like it was more work than just making your own missile to start off with. At that point, it, it looked like you were better off just scrapping the missile for parts and, and using the parts to make your own. Um, so if you're exporting something that's dedicated for, for uh, anti-air mode, the chances of that being convertible are less. If you're selling an obsolete system um, that wasn't particularly optimized for surface to air roll, then the chances of conversion are greater. So this is a bit of a dilemma because when you're exporting weapons, typically you look at, well, how does this perform compared to what's available in the region? And it might, it, it seems counterintuitive to recommend selling the more advanced model. But in some cases, if you know the country you're selling to is uh, interested in obtaining a ballistic capability or in improving its ballistic capability, maybe it makes more sense to actually give them the advanced sand because you know they'll never be able to convert. Um, at this point, I think I've rambled on for a <laughs> fair amount, so I'll open it up to questions or suggestions for the thesis. Thank um, you very much. That was um, really fascinating and actually admirably uh, succinct on the presentation. Put a lot of as much time as everybody would like for Q&A, and I think since you can see everybody, just raise your hand if you have a question, uh, and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, great job, first of all. Um, question about, I guess the, the S-300 is, is a radar-guided missile system, right? Yes. The, in its original form, the way it's designed. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go back. Question is, yeah, you mentioned that, that the Iraqis at one point left the original guidance system in. Yeah. How do you know? I mean, how integrated that that radar guidance is in that system? Or I mean, clearly they made it work, but how much did they have to retool what was already in there from you know the radar guidance to inputting for the Iraqis or whoever? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the as far as I know, the Iraqis ripped it out, okay. um, just removed it, and then put in an initial guidance system that they developed. And um, some of these are stabilized from other missiles, mm -hmm. and some of these they try to produce themselves. The ones they produced themselves were horrible, and the, the inaccuracy was huge. But they were hoping that um, after producing several uh, versions of these, they would get better. And there's a lot of technical details that exceed my knowledge in the Unmovic files, if you're, actually, if you're interested in looking. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, very nice pictures of the uh, several examples of Iraqi... Uh, inertial guidance systems from those missiles. Was it the Koreans who kept it in then? The Koreans kept it in, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so the, the Korean missile is this one. Uh, Looks like a Nike, right? Yeah. They took a Nike Hercules missile and it's, it's very unclear what ended up happening to the missile, what, um, where they got the technology to change it from. There's two possibilities. There's there was some amount of technology transfer from the U.S., um, but that program, the details of the program remain classified. The, the code name is declassified, but whatever's uh, whatever the extent of the cooperation of the South Koreans and exactly what the U.S. advisors taught the South Koreans is not really known. There's another rumor, uh, and this was uh, Oh Wan Shol, the head of the, one of the principal heads of the South Korean missile program. Um, apparently, he said that the French uh, SNPE firm had uh, provided the solid propellant, and that's the story CIA believed at the time from declassified, uh, from one declassified document. It's the only available estimate of the technology. In, um, in the engine and the, the missile. But when I try to find the originals in the French archives, there's nothing. So I don't know if that's because it's classified, because it, it is fairly recent, so it would fall under the 50 year rule in France. Um, or if you know, that was just a story that they spawned for CIA and CIA gobbled it. I, I don't know. Hmm. 
<laughs> in your work, did you come across, <coughs> oh, excuse me, any kind of rule of thumb that might correlate, for example, the, the intercept altitude and surface to air mode with range uh, and ballistic mode? Right. So, not really. The, the, ring, the rule of thumb would be the, the half rule. But I found that in many cases, the, the range that was advertised, the max range for the surface-to-air missile, was significantly shorter than what the missile could actually, the distance it could actually go. Because the, the max range reported is the max engagement range that the team is trained to, to employ. So things like the, the SA-3 has a very small max range uh, reported. But when the, when the Iraqis converted it, it's, this, is, I think, uh, this is close to four times what the SA-3 is supposed to have max range, which is much more than the half. Yeah, I would think that the max intercept altitude would, would be more of a, have more correlation to the ballistic right. range than the, than the operational mm -hmm. range. And the problem is obtaining the max altitude is not um, not easy. I have it for uh, this one, for this one, and that's because <coughs> I have an internal <coughs> for the missile. But most of the figures that get reported are the max engagement range, and that's just labeled max range. Yeah, and those are have... those are probably underestimated too. Yeah. Sorry, one more. Yep. Do you, I, I don't know. Do you, do you know off the top of your head if uh, Assad's SAMs are vulnerable to take over by uh, ISIS? And that obviously wouldn't have the technical capabilities. But well, for um, so there's a there's a pretty interesting case that happened with Libyan uh, missiles that were used in ground attack mode that were improvised mm -hmm. use. Um, that that is rare though. Mm -hmm. uh, and Oryx Oryx Black, I think, broke the story on that. So you, you can use by whom? Uh, I believe by Libyan rebels, but I don't know which faction they no. uh, Something else that we've seen a lot more of is um, helicopter rocket pods. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be mounted on the helicopter right. and used from the helicopter to the ground. But uh, people have been taking those and mounting it on trucks and using that, or mounting it on tanks. And Whatever it takes. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's quite effective. But obviously, it's not a it's not a guided missile. It's right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a small rocket. <laughs> so do you? I don't know if you have one of your backup slides or not, but um, I'd be curious to know just what's the current list of countries that export SAMs and and the SAMs that are on the market. I mean, how how many? people and products are we talking about here? Um, if, yeah, so I, I don't actually have a slide for all of the SAM exporters, but the, the major ones would be the US, Russia, um, well, the, the major systems that I'm concerned about are the ones that use like, really big missiles. Right. Um, so it would be the S-300 family, the Chinese clone of that, there's uh, some very nice U.S. Uh, SAMs that I've exported. The, I'm not sure what the status is on the, the French, but I know their latest models would be very hard to convert. And they're very small. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're designed to be very maneuverable, and uh, they have very thin uh, casings. And so if you, if you were to change, the, change it from surface to air, to surface to surface, when you do that, you change the forces exerted on the right. missile. And um, if you have a missile that has a lot of uh, guidance fins, that that's a problem. If you have a missile that's very thin, very optimized, then that's a problem. Some of these missiles can break. The other thing is the, <coughs> the reason why I'm looking at the big missiles are the ones that have uh, long range, right, a lot of fuel and the ones that have a decent payload. So there are small uh, surface-to-air missiles available, but they'll have short range and usually short payloads, and that's not very enticing. The reason I'm worried about the 48 is because the, the payload is, is significant, 200 kilograms, and the, the size is also, is also nice. Recent the recent export for a 300 would be Belarus and would be Venezuela. 
there's also um, some rumors of uh, maybe an Egyptian deal. Um, there's uh, the chases for the S300 that have been painted in desert camo that appeared at one of the factories in Russia. And there was some media speculation there that these were originally designed for Syria, but because of the civil war, they couldn't sell it to them, so they would maybe sell them to Egypt. Um, but and in, in that case, there's something, there's a, an, an even larger missile than the 48. I don't think it's been exported before, but the rumored variants that, are, uh, that the Russians want to export now are the ones that use that missile in Russia. So if that one hits the market, then I'll be very scared because that one is, is better. It's like 9.5 meters long. It's a two-stage solid missile. Uh, enormous range, right. yeah. and that's the trend that is, uh, and it's also a very solid build. Uh, there's no not much guidance on it, so um, that's the trend that I'm concerned about. Export of uh, very long range missiles, and that seems to be driven a lot by the um, anti ballistic missile market. And so the the this missile that I'm referring to, the Russian one, is their anti-ballistic missile uh, of choice. And the exports that the Chinese talked about was for the uh, US. If the, if the number of um, uh, practical uh, uh, exporters is fairly small, there might still be some prospects for uh, you know, negotiated cooperative solutions. You don't have to get the whole MTCR membership to agree on New language to close uh, the loophole. The, the particular three you mentioned don't have the uh, best relations in the world with each other right now. But yeah. but talks among three parties just are easier to have succeed than you know talks among thirty eight or forty or whatever. Is the, right. In that case, it's membership. very hard for us to um, ask them not to export these systems because we do it. So um, it'll be hard. So. <laughs> That's right. And, and you'll have a big internal debate inside the U.S. about the trade offs between those. Right. And if the other parties will respect the deal or not. Um, the what I liked about what I what's nice about the MTCR is the guidelines are public, right? So there's some transparency there. Uh, there's <coughs> negotiations within the MTCR about how to interpret these guidelines. We're not privy to that, so maybe there is some agreement about exactly what, like, at what point you consider conversion. Is um, do you consider conversion? One of the options is well, if you need to make modifications on the missile, then uh, we're not, like external modifications, like removing fins, um, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, but you might have to take into account the actual range as is. I don't mm -hmm. know. All of that would, would be decided between MTCR members themselves. But if you have clear language up front that everyone can see, everyone can refer to, at least that puts public pressure for countries to follow a deal. Have you tried to, um, I don't even know who it is, but whoever in the U.S. government is our MTCR delegate, have you tried to, to communicate with that person no, ask for clarification? <laughs> you could probably reach out. You'd be surprised what questions people really? in the bureaucracy will, will okay. answer. Sure. So you might, you might be able to engage in some discussion with them. Okay. Other questions we must ask? Presentation was so good, you left us with now. <laughs> no questions. Anything in your backup slides you wanted to share? We have a little time if you want to. Sure. Um, so, I found so this one was interesting um, when I talked about the things you could do if you had a missile with just a, um, where the diameter was just too small. Um, this is this would be a complicated conversion, but as far as I know, the Soviets didn't deploy this, but this was in one of the internal documents. And they've clustered the engines and gotten more room from there. Um, as a result, they could increase the diameter. So that's one of the more complicated ways that you could get a missile with a bigger diameter. At that point, you're really redesigning the missile. That was an interesting one I found. Uh, 
How's your Russian? <laughs> Terrible. I got I, I got the Russian speakers here to <laughs> confirm. Yeah, fortunately, you've got a lot of people you can get to have talking <laughs> with that. Yeah. I guess so. <coughs> right. So this one was just for the um, categories. Um, my concern is that you would have a category two system, uh, something just underneath category two. So a SAM that's classed as having a 280 kilometer range. So when it's exported, um, everyone gives the green light. There's no empty cert doesn't play a role. And then once it reaches the country, the country converts it. <coughs> and because of the conversion, they gain range. And so you get you suddenly have a category two system in country after conversion. This was the S300 family. Um, there's new ones, but these are the, the old ones. So you can see it's, it's quite old. And every time uh, they upgrade it, there's a new, tends to be a new missile that goes with it. And um, the missile that I'm concerned about would be this one. And this was the predecessor for which we have that on. Yeah. Are you mainly concerned about like a, a WMD warhead or high explosive or both? So the default would be the high explosives, and that's what um, all of the countries on the list did. But because um, most of these, the payload is just too small. Um, in in that case, with the forty eight, uh, the it's just. Um, just too small, and so you, you might be able to use some tricks to actually get a payload, and it's one of the reasons why it's a scary system. But the primary reason is because it's solid fuel and because the alleged range was so large. And when we tried to model it, the, that range seems at least uh, from the first impression possible. Uh, maybe, maybe not the whole 400 kilometers, but at least more than 200 kilometers which is already better than what you would get with a Toshka C. Um, Do you know anything about how much, if it's just a high explosive warhead, it's, I mean, the SAMs are obviously made to take down aircraft. That's yeah. a separate, totally separate mechanism from, probably from what it would take to, to prime an explosive to go on a, on a ground. I mean, do you know, do you have any idea of what they had to change around in terms of, in terms of making it go boom? boom? Yeah. Um, so, as, as far as I know, it's a directional warhead. So when it, it when it's about to hit a plane, it, um, it shoots fragments in a cone at the plane. So I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to just point the cone down. Okay. So just yeah. yeah, spray down. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask a very very lay person question. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. It's actually. As somebody that knows nothing about this, it's quite easy to follow through. Right. Why should I be concerned about the results that you are coming up with as a light person? Right. Um, because in the technical literature, this conversion process is well recognized, but in in policy documents, it's ignored. And I wanted to draw attention to the fact that several countries in the past have used this technique. And that this technique, as SAMs get better, um, becomes more attractive. Right? So when we export systems abroad, we need to pay more attention to the possibility that the SAMs we export will be converted. And when we see other countries export SAMs, we should also keep in mind that maybe the SAMs are for something else, not just against them. Yeah. So I think Marek's question about the, the um, payload is that the key one that with the right missile, if you also have a clandestine nuclear program, you can think about using that as your delivery vehicle. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for um, for the South Koreans, this was a U.S. concern because the the payload was enormous, and there's uh, diplomatic cables at the time when the South Koreans were trying to acquire the solid fuel technology to make their own, saying, "Do you really want to give them this technology that they can use to make a nuclear capable missile?" Because at the time, the South Koreans also had a clandestine, not so clandestine. <laughs> and um, some of it was also for show. The South Koreans uh, revealed it because we were withdrawing from South Korea. So there was back and forth with that. When the South Koreans couldn't get missiles from the US, they played, played up the French connection. 
And um, but that's why I'm not 100% convinced of this, this French linkage that's um, reported in the CIA report. I, I think maybe that was fed to CIA. Um, Did they mention anything about the uh, maximum range if they drop a payload to like 200 kilograms instead of the 500? Yes, so if you drop the payload, the range increases. How, how much though? Was it significant? Or? Um, so I didn't, in those cables, I did not see for the night calculus. I don't know. I don't know. I think they were assuming that the payload was going to be, uh, I guess, nuclear, yeah. and that they would keep it at 500. Kilograms. Uh, but when, uh, when Park was assassinated, the US apparently reached an agreement with the South Koreans that limited the missile to 180 kilometers and 300 kilogram payload, so less than the 500. So I, I really think they were concerned about the nuclear, yeah. nuclear more than the range. Because um, uh, the distance to hit Pyongyang was 150 kilometers. So that was already like... Just enough to hit the city. Good enough. And then the, that was, uh, 180 was good enough to hit Nampo as well, the big staging. So, yeah. Anybody else with questions? If not, then uh, join me in thanking Philip for a really interesting presentation.